Hello and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I have sales legend, author, speaker, and sales philosopher, Mike Bosworth as my guest. Mike, welcome. I'm happy to be here with you, Marcus. I think we're about uh, eight or nine time zones apart today. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Mike, would you mind giving uh, the audience 60 to 90 seconds on your background, please? I grew up poor with uh, no real good role models. I ended up at the age of 19 going into the Army and ended up serving 13 months in Vietnam. I realized I was a pawn and a huge political thing. But in Vietnam, I did get the opportunity to learn a little bit of data processing, and I ended up running the IBM's card system in Saigon that managed the inventory of U.S. officers in the country. And so when I was coming back from Vietnam, I wrote IBM a letter, and I told them about my experience with their uh, card computer and asked them for a job, and they said, Mike, we think you should go to college. So... I went to uh, Cal Poly Pomona on the GI Bill. And uh, when I graduated in 1972, almost 25 years old, the luckiest thing in my life is I got an entry level job with Xerox Computer Services in 1972. And Xerox Computer Services, in essence, invented cloud computing. I spent a year on the help desk another uh, year and a half taking care of customers, and then they asked me to go into sales. And I had two answers, no and hell no. One, my violent alcoholic father was a salesman. That's the last thing I wanted to do is be like him. And the second thing was all the Xerox computer services clients I've been taking care of, the sales, our salespeople lied to them about the price and lied to them about what the system would do. So, in virtually all of them, I had to turn, turn around and reshift the expectations. So I had no respect for the sales profession at all. So Xerox came back a week later and said, we, we really want you to try sales. We're going to take away your risk. We're going to give it to you in writing. That if you try for six months, at the end of six months, you can have your application support job back and you can keep your application support salary while you try your try sales for six months. Well, I had a huge advantage that we can get into later that none of the other experienced IBM salespeople who we had hired, because our CEO was from IBM, so virtually all the experienced salespeople we hired were 35 to 45 years old, and they were star top 20% IBM salespeople. Right. So I went into sales. In 1972, at 28 years old, in my first five months, I sold more than anybody in the history of the company. It sold in a full year. And then they promoted me to sales manager and said, teach everybody to do what you do, Mike. I was completely unable to because I did it all on intuition. So I crashed and burned. So I went from hero to zero. Eventually, thanks to um, Xerox wanting me to be a trainer and My affiliation with Neil Rackham, I finally learned that the real key to sales productivity is to figure out how to codify what the top 20% do and teach it to the bottom 80%. So that's my introduction. Excellent. Okay, so the most obvious question to follow on from that is how do you empower the bottom 80% to sell as well as the top 20%? Well, up until 2008, from 1983 to 2008, I was teaching them a a, a rigorous sales process called solution selling or customer-centric selling, which taught them to use discovery questions written by the smartest people in the company, et cetera, et cetera. But it didn't change the 80-20 ratio. And... So the way we empower the bottom 80% now is we teach, and this is not just the sales profession, Marcus. You could really say that 20% of humanity are really good at intuitively connecting with people and building trust, and 80% of people in all professions, teachers, politicians, lawyers, doctors, aren't very good at connecting with strangers. So the real key... The missing link is how do we teach average people who grew up in a family where 
there wasn't a lot of um, emotional connection. There wasn't a lot of vulnerability. Maybe dad was macho and said, don't cry and don't be a baby. They didn't learn how to express their emotions and feelings. And so the real key is to teach the bottom 80% how to connect with strangers and build connection and trust in a very short amount of time. And we use the power of story to do that. We teach them how to build effective stories, how to practice telling those stories, and then how to tend the buyer's story. So it, the story model allows average people to connect with strangers. Okay, so let's start with how do you build effective stories? Is there a framework, a structure that people can learn to apply in their real world? Absolutely. When we started trying to figure out how do we teach people how to use the power of story, we went to the experts. And the best storytelling experts to me are in Hollywood. Of course, they have two hours to tell that story and they have big budgets. But if you look at most Hollywood movies, let's take, let's take the classic chick flick. Boy meets girl. So in the, in the beginning of the movie, you fall in love with the boy, you fall in love with the girl, they have chemistry, they, you know, they have this beautiful vision of falling in love. And then they start hitting the struggle, the potholes. And so most of the movie is now, oh God, she thought he was cheating, da, 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 da. And so most of the movie is struggle and uh, conflict. But then, you know, late in the movie at the top of the story arc, New Year's Eve, New York City, the boy and the girl meet again at the top of the Empire State Building. They kiss, kiss, kiss and make up. And then you see one year later and they're pushing a baby carriage through, through, through Central Park. But that story arc is what Hollywood uses. And so we, like, we, we have to first teach our customers to build stories about happy customers, their happy customers, where the hero of the story is not their product, not their solution, not their technology, not how smart they are, their consultants or the support. The heroes of the story, stories are customers, happy, successful customers. So when we go into a new client, even though they, you know, They've got great technology. We first have to help them harvest happy customer stories or what we call customer hero stories. Well, this is really interesting because there is so much training about that focuses on pain, pain, pain equals dollar, dollar, dollar. But that goes against the architecture and biochemistry of the brain because people need to be able to perceive a better future before they're willing to open up. And You're then you exactly can right. create the gap. You're exactly right. Okay. So, and there's one other philosophical thing I just want to throw in here at this point is people hate to feel sold, but they love to buy. So our philosophy is let's facilitate their buy cycle. And if we are really in harmony with their buy cycle and we bring them step-by-step step through their buy cycle, will rarely have to close. And if you, if you look at really top-notch salespeople, they rarely have to close because they're so in tune with the way their buyers want to buy that at the end of it, the buyer says, well, isn't there something I need to sign here? How do we get this thing started? They buy. So I have a question that's been bothering me for a while, which is, is what passes for great in sales fit for purpose? If what is for great, what passes for great? Yes. Well, most really great salespeople are not doing it on purpose. They're doing it intuitively, which means they can't tell, teach other people. So th the real key is to build what this, the top-notch people do intuitively into a model that we can teach the bottom 80%. The, the, uh, the mother load of uh, potential, potential sales productivity is getting the bottom 80% lifted. And they need a model for connection and trust before they dive into their discovery questions. 
And so we, we call our model story seekers and we say it's sales methodology agnostic. In other words, we've been hired by solution selling clients who were frustrated because 80, the bottom 80% quit using it. And once we teach the bottom 80% how to connect using the power of story, they already know the discovery questions. They, they almost overnight turn around. Understood. Let me rephrase the question then. What normally passes for being a great salesperson when managers are looking to hire is they tend to look for self-starters, self-motivated, highly competitive, will-to-win, motivated by money. My experience of people who are uh, wired like that, they're ghastly human beings. They're not people that customers uh, readily trust because they're competitive, not collaborative. They want to win, so by definition, someone has to lose, and often it's the customer. And their motivation is to make the sale and get the money and get to the top of the leaderboard rather than to serve the customer. So they're very transactional and they end up churning customers quickly. Retention rates, profitability rates, lifetime customer value is lost. So my my question about what is fit for purpose, when you describe that top 20%, I understand they do it intuitively. But what are the qualities they possess that make them stand apart from all the other salespeople, other than the ability to engage at a rapport level? Well, I think the things that make them stand stand apart are they have an abundance mentality. They're not into a win-lose. They're into uh, what Stephen Covey used to call a win-win or no deal. If we can't come to some agreement where both of us win, we shouldn't be doing business. And um, they don't pressure, they don't twist arms. They want to help their customers make money, save money, achieve goals and solve problems. That's their need, to wanna help their customers become heroes. Well, it's really interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, I think it's James Cates who wrote the book finite and infinite games. A finite game player understands the game ends and their job is to win or not to lose. Whereas an infinite game player has an abundance mentality. Their objective is to keep the game going and make the pie bigger for everyone. And so they're not after a bigger slice of a shrinking pie. They make the pie bigger so anyone can have as much as they like. There's enough for everybody. Okay, so in terms of the ideal salesperson, if you were to design them, you're the creator, and you could design the ideal salesperson. Describe to me those qualities, those those characteristics, the values and beliefs that underpin their behavior. Well, I'm not sure they're even that conscious of their values and beliefs, but I would love to have hire ex-teachers. I think if somebody goes into teaching, give me that person and I can teach them how to sell and make a lot more money. But, but I like their, uh, their purpose in life, to teach, to help, to grow. They're unselfish. And by the way, those despicable human beings you described, they make great CEOs of public companies. <laughs> Absolutely. But again, the research on that, is really damning. The impact, the positive impact that CEOs add is around 7%. And uh, the American boardroom, 5% of US board members are clinically psychopathic, whereas on death row, only 3%. Yeah, Um, no, no. (laughs) I'm with you. Marcus, I've seen so many great companies over the years go to hell in a handbasket when they went public. Because when they were private, senior management was into growing employees and developing happy customers and and developing better products. But once they go public, now they got to make that quarterly number. And this, this is the thing that, forgive me, but it really pisses me off. Because 
Privately held companies that operate on quarterly reporting cycles are effectively cutting their own hamstring. And what you end up with is people who forget that you exist because of the customer, not in spite of them. And the research on the S&P 500 between 2010 and 2016 that Gallup ran, I think it was Gallup, the companies that had highly engaged employees had 273% higher profit per employee, 130% higher revenue per employee. Staff turnover was 40% lower. Daily productivity was 20% higher. And year-on-year, -year, compound share price growth was 316% higher than the companies that had mildly or actively disengaged employees. If you're a hard-blooded, stone-hearted capitalist, it doesn't make sense to drive the business into losing money, losing customers, and losing staff by being a total ass. Why do they do it? Well, most privately held companies I've known aren't driven by quarterly numbers because senior management doesn't care. I didn't care. I had an amazing privately held company called Solution Selling with 75 employees, you know, doing 10 plus million dollars a year. I never had a, a budget, never had anything. It was... But the minute venture capital and private equity come in... It starts to ruin the process. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly. So again, I mean, I'm really interested about the point that you made about teachers. There is an insurance company in the UK, very successful, called Direct Line, and they only hire people from caring professions for their yeah. sales and um, uh, support desks. There's a real uh, message in there because these people are high on empathy. Yeah. They're great listeners. They yeah. care about solving other people's problems. Yep. Yeah. Their ego is out of the way. Yeah. Okay. Really interesting. Um, so did you notice who, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos, the guy at Amazon who got the divorce and his wife ended up getting uh, $35 billion. Did you see who she married? Nope. She married the teacher, a middle school teacher of one of her children. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a win. <laughs> Boy, that's a win for him, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So come back to Story Seekers. So the first thing you do is harvest those better future stories. Then what happens? All right, so let's just say, I'm gonna give you my personal example. And I did this intuitively when I was 28 years old and I spent, it took me 30 years to codify it. But I had the privilege of installing and implementing a first generation MRP system for a manufacturing plant in Orange County, California, where the results were beyond phenomenal financial. And, um, the receptionist would call the materials manager and say, I've got this guy from Xerox in the lobby who wants to talk to you. 80% of the time they would come out back then. Primary reason back then in, in um, 1974 is the only way they could learn anything about new technology was to see salespeople. Absolutely. They didn't have the internet, right? So, so they'd come out and he's 48 I'm 28. As soon as he comes out and sees me, before he, I even shake his hand, they go like this. Because they think, oh, shit. And you look at his watch. You look at his watch. I now have to be polite to this kid for 15 minutes before I can give him the boot. Because how can he, that young, know anything, right? Yeah. So I'd confirm with him. I'd say, so you're the materials manager here. And he'd say yes. And I'd say, can I share a quick story with you about another materials manager I've been working with for the last 18 months who's less than a mile from you. Never did I have that story turned down, ever. 100% of them said, sure. And I'll just give you a synopsis. First, the setting. The setting is the story is about a guy named Ed Blackman. He's now the president of the Orange County Apex chapter. And I met Ted or Ed two years ago because my boss made me go to Apex meetings so I could learn more about manufacturing. And Ed's, the, Ed's the, been the materials manager at LPAC Electronics for the last uh, three years. And he had a terrible job. Every day he'd come in and his CFO is 
pissed at him because he's carrying way too much inventory, it's ruining the bottom line of the company. His VP of manufacturing is mad at him because he's missing his shipment schedule, all because Ed can't control shortages. And 18 months ago, when Ed found out that Xerox has now created new technology that will enable him to do a complete replan of his entire plant, even though he has 50,000 uh, component parts, overnight, he decided he was going to be our first MRP customer. He, that we had no other existing customers. He had to take the risk of being an innovator and an early adopter. That was 18 months ago. Today, if you look at his numbers, his inventory was 8 million. Now it's down to 2.7 million. His past due backlog 18 months ago was 27%. Now it's 2%. He's got the shortages completely under control, and he's in line to get to be the VP of manufacturing. But enough about me, Marcus. What's going on here? <laughs> Excellent. I filled my pipeline with that one story. And at the end of that story, invariably, after one minute, they'd say, you want to come in and look around? And they'd take me into the plant and give me a 45-minute tour of the plant. Now I can do my discovery questions. Because my story, my peer story, he said yes to the peer story out of peer curiosity. But at the end of that story, one minute later, he had peer envy. And there's no stronger buying, emotional buying motivation for anybody in corporate America than peer envy. I love that. I shall be stealing that. You'll get credit once. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Very, very interesting. Okay, so you tell the peer story, that then is driven by curiosity, that then lowers their resistance so that you can engage in discovery. In discovery, yeah. That story eliminates the discovery resistance. Right, okay. So once you're in the discovery process, how else do you use stories? Well, you, you've got little anecdotal stories. And again, I did it at the time intuitively, but we were selling a system. Yeah, it did shortages, but it did closing the books. It did payroll. It did cost accounting. And so as I'd go through the company and I'd meet the cost accountant, I'd say, can I tell you a quick story about another cost account? You know, so I had, I had stories for all the functional players within my prospect. Very interesting. So did you, uh, did you build this into a playbook? No, because I had those stories because I had personally worked hands-on making the product work. I understood. That's why when they promoted me, Marcus, I was clueless. I understand, Mike, but now... Oh, uh, now, yeah. Yeah, so you build those functional stories into the playbook. How quickly does that increase... Uh, how much does that increase the speed of ramp up for new hires? Oh, it, it's incredible um, because we can get new hires. We had a client, a big uh, $3 billion a year uh, electronic or a networking company called Mitel. They realized that product marketing was ruining <laughs> the buying process and oh. the ramp up process for new salespeople because they were teaching the product as a noun instead of a verb. In the workshop, we would teach these people how to smoothly tell that 60 second customer hero story. But these, this guy, he was right out of college, he's in a bullpen, he's paid to dial for dollars. But now when he calls and he gets a CIO on the phone, he says, oh, you're the CIO? Can I share a quick story with you about another CIO? They all say yes. And his first week in the bullpen, he found a new prospect that turned into being a $7 million deal. He, you know, he, he got him excited and passed it out to an, over to an outside rep. But in other words, if you can teach new, new hires to effectively tell real stories, you can have them prospecting in a week. Very interesting. They can't do the whole. They can't do the whole buy sell cycle in a week, but boy, they sure can help you fill your pipeline. And then you'll let them ride along and be apprentices for the senior people when the senior people take over the deal. 
Well, again, this is something that really frustrates me. There was a time when I started out, back when Methuselah was a kid, and your manager would go on ride-alongs with you, and um, they would observe you, and they would, uh, they would coach what they saw. But we're in the third generation now of sales managers who don't know how to prospect. They definitely don't know how to coach. Their yeah. route into the role is, Mike, we've just fired your idiot manager. Congratulations, you're now the idiot manager. Right. And that's your runway, uh, which is the only education you've ever had is what was done to you. So yeah. if you were designing a sales operation from scratch, what would the runway and career path look like for a new salesperson who had the potential to move into management? Well, the new salesperson would go through the Story Seekers workshop, ideally in their first week on board, but that company would already have a repository of true customer hero stories by job title and industry so that we could teach them to practice telling. And then that company would have the ability to smoothly teach the new employee to hand off to a, a senior rep as soon as they would get somebody who wants to know more. Somebody, so their job is to develop peer envy. And then once there's peer envy, bring in a senior person. And then ideally, I'd let my junior person be part of that process and learn like an apprentice. Okay. And so what do they need to learn over the next 12 to 24 months so that they can evolve into a more senior role? They need to learn how to manage the, uh, the corporate buying process, which means we start off with a sponsor and the sponsor admits pain, has a vision, and we document that buying vision story in an email. We send it to the sponsor and then the sponsor loves that letter so much because it's their future story. They, they share it. And so our, what, what we do is we measure public displays of trust by the buying committee. So the first big public display of trust is, sure, I'll listen to your story. The next public display of trust is they start opening up and sharing freely. And then the big one, they trust you enough to share their pain. I don't like saying to buyers, do you have a problem with A, B, and C? I want my buyer to volunteer to me that he's got a problem with A, B, and C. So when they volunteer to buy, then you can solidify the vision, you can document it, but it's really learning how to manage that corporate buying process where they have a committee, they need to get three bids, you know, we have to do proof, we have to uh, help them do an ROI, we have to help them have a transition plan of how they get from where they are today to having new, this new system implemented. We have to teach them how to handle the risk phase of the buy cycle at the end when all of a sudden they get cold feet. So, I mean, the, the enterprise buying process is complex and it's going to take them a year to be able to fly solo on that. Very interesting. Okay. So, but it's not pounding the product into them. Uh, no, pro uh, the product training is lethal. But I see it so often in tech in particular. There's nothing they love more than inflicting product training on salespeople who then go and inflict it on yeah. uh, customers. And the other problem, I think, is that so many organizations are fixated on training so that they can check a box and their emphasis is on retention. And as a result of that, they're not focused on what actually matters, which is application. Right. And what I've noticed is that at least 70% of learning happens out of the classroom in the field, in the real world. Absolutely. And it's not reinforced because managers do not know how to coach. The new salesperson training in most of these high-tech companies is 
is relegated to product marketing, which is a disaster. Can I tell you a quick story about how I finally figured out how to kill product marketing? Oh, yes, please. I'm doing a public solution selling workshop. I have 24 people at the U, but they're all from different companies. So the first morning I'm going around, what do you sell? What do you sell? What do you sell? And I get around to most of the people there are selling complex, intangible, hard to explain, hard to justify new technology. I get around to this guy, Richard. I said, Richard, what are you selling? He says, Mike, I sell glue. And I said, you know, Richard, I've never had a glue salesperson go through one of my workshops before. And then my next question, I wanted to grab it and shove it back in my mouth, but it slipped out. And I said, tell me about the glue. Well, he was a chemical engineer, master's in chemical engineering from MIT. And if you ask a, a chemical engineer to tell you about the glue, get ready for a long answer. He started talking, it was industrial. He talks about bonding and vibration and mold and temperature and moisture. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I, uh, I gave him the timeout sign and I said, Richard, sounds to me like you're using the word glue as a noun. Can you change it to a verb and tell me about your product? And he was smart. He, went, he got it. As soon as it's now verb, he's, now he started talking about the gluing his customers are able to do. And that's the problem with product training. Product, product marketing is teaching nouns. And buyers need verbs. Buyers need to be able to visualize how will I use this when this bad thing occurs to help me solve this problem, not nouns. Well, Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, my friend, uh, Bob Mester, always talks about customers renting outcomes. They never buy the product. No one in the history of humanity has ever woken up and said, you know, uh, as a, even as a kid, all I wanted was an ERP system. Uh, it's just never going to happen. That's like talking <laughs> about your ugly children to strangers. Yeah. And I think one of the really important things that every salesperson needs to understand is relevance. You need to be timely, you need to be contextually appropriate, and you always, always have to be relevant. If you fail on any one of those things, then you are just an unwelcome interruption. And part of the problem is that so many salespeople are uh, sent using brute force uh, to speak to people who are not in the right place in their buying cycle to contemplate buying what you have to offer. What you're offering is contextually inappropriate or you're, ver you're nouning it rather than verbing it. And it's not relevant to them because you're not putting it in the context in which they live and they work. Right. So what advice would you give to managers? Because I believe managers are fundamentally the most important people in a sales organization because they can make or break a great team or an average team, and you can turn a great team into one that's performing terribly, or you can take a very average team and make them as a team superstars. So what advice would you give to a manager? The problem I see today, Marcus, is nobody's doing decent management training. When I was at Xerox, boy, they invested in training. So with, with the absence of training today in 2021, we recommend, see, selling is not an academic subject, it's a skill. And if it's a skill, it takes coaching and practice. And so, what we prefer to do if we go into a new client is, is say, I want to train your cadre, your managers and story seekers first. And so let's say we have 16 managers on the Zoom training for three days. And after we lecture for 45 minutes, then we have a breakout where we practice. We go into Zoom rooms and everybody's in a small group of three or four people with a coach. And so the managers learn how to coach and tend stories. Then when we train the salespeople, we have their own managers 
serve as role play coaches. And by having them take it first as a salesperson and then have to come back and coach their own people in it under our supervision, they learn how to debrief calls and coach and help them build letters and do the things that on their own, they're just never going to learn. Okay, so I have a fairly radical view on this, and I'd be curious uh, your response. I fundamentally believe it is an act of gross misconduct for a salesperson to turn up after the company has spent money on marketing, on lead generation, on securing the meeting, and they turn up unresearched, unplanned, unrehearsed without a written plan, without clarity in terms of what they're trying to achieve from the outcome of the sale. And then they come out of it without capturing any lessons, without debriefing, and uh, their managers are at fault for allowing them to do this. And I believe both should be uh, censured, if not fired, if they do that more than once. Um, well, uh, being unfair, most sales managers, Marcus, were made sales manager because they sold a lot and they've never taught to be man. They, I was never taught to manage. I, they, they don't know what managing is. They have their position because they were a great salesperson. There was a study done by Jonathan Farrington for the Sandler Research Center that came out in 2020. And his findings are that only 6% of sales managers are actually fit for purpose. And this is a really damning indictment of leadership because they do not create an apprenticeship and they do not create a runway. Where, right. um, I, I work with a number of technology companies and what we're doing with all of those companies is we find out what the career ambitions are of the salespeople and we train them in the skills of management or channel management or senior account management in the... 12 to 24 months before they progress to their next position. So they learn how to onboard a new hire. So last one in coaches the next one in. Then they get involved in coaching, mentoring, training, running sales meetings, developing forecasts and reports, planning, strategizing, debriefing calls, so that by the time they get into the role, they've interviewed prospective candidates. They understand all of those different functions because they've lived them. And I think we need to implement sales apprenticeships and management apprenticeships. Well, you better write a white paper because the vast majority of U.S. public companies are not investing in sales training or management training. They just hire them, they push them out there. And like Oracle is a classic example. You don't make your number, you're out. It's sink or swim. Well, only 3% of the budget is spent on management training. That's more than a lot of companies I see. They have no, no, no budget no, no. for management. That, that's the global spend on training, yeah. only 3%. Yeah. It's pitiful. So it's time for you to write a book, Marcus. B2B selling and sales apprenticeships and developing great sales managers, because there's no book out there to, on how to do that. Well, it, interestingly enough, I'm in collaboration with a friend of mine who is the grandfather of sales enablement. We're writing a book on sales management enablement because it, it, it's appalling. It is appalling. It's appalling. It's an act of incompetence by leadership. So can I tell you one more nugget? Yes, please. Another thing Neil Rackham discovered accidentally, because Neil Rackham was only watching top 20% sales calls. And back then, Xerox, big company, they'd hire six new batches of new salespeople out of top 10 colleges, put them in six weeks of product training, kick them out of the nest and say, go sell for Xerox. Now, this is copiers and fax machines, not my division. Yeah. And these salespeople will get better and better and better. But at 18 months, each batch, you could set your watch by it. They would peak and start to plummet. Right. And what it, what it turned out was what they lacked initially to be effective in the first year was solution expertise. It took them a long time to develop solution expertise. 
But in the in their 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th months, they had developed enough solution expertise that when a buyer would bring up a problem, they would help diagnose the problem, help them create a vision. But after 18 months, they became impatient. And now the buyer, the first day of the 19th month, the buyer starts to admit a problem and the seller goes, oh, we see this all the time. This is out of whack, this is out of whack, this is out of whack, here's what you need. And as soon as they salespeople start telling buyers what they need, their performance goes down. So in my workshops, I'll say to my salespeople, I say, if you don't believe me on the next break, I say, how many of you have a long-term partner, romantic partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse? And then 80% raise their hand. I said, on the next break, call that person on your mobile device, give them two to three you need to statements and see how they respond. <laughs> and uh, they come back in with their tails between their legs. And I say, if the person who in theory loves you more than anybody else won't take that from you, why would your prospect? So we now teach them that when the buyer admits a problem, to say, oh, can I tell you a story about another person who had that same problem? Yeah. And slow it down and give them the lesson from the other, from their peers' perspective, instead of the salesperson saying, here's what you need. You need our total solution to fix this problem. My sales hero is Columbo. Yeah. No one ever assumed they would get caught. He was always diffident. He was always the underdog. He struggled. And if you learn to play your sale like Columbo, um, then no one ever thinks you're the smartest person in the room. Right. Uh, I've been when... using Columbo for years. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Mike, look, I've got a few uh, quick questions to wrap up. The first one is you've got a golden ticket. And you can go back and whisper in the ear of the young Mike, age 23, at his full idiot best. What bit of advice would you give him that you know he would have probably ignored but would have been of value? Well, I don't think I would have ignored it. If, I, if someone could have shown me back then how what I was doing intuitively could be codified so we could teach it to everybody else, my career would have ramped up much fat faster. Uh, absolutely. Well, when I was 23, I knew everything. Now I'm 53, I realize I know next to nothing. <laughs> I, I think wisdom is wasted on the old and youth is wasted on the young. Youth is wasted on the young, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me this. One thing that you're struggling with at the moment, what are you wrestling with? Uh, what I'm wrestling with in helping my wife with her weekend style business, which we're now, we, we built a desktop application and it was too linear. So now we're building a, a mobile device weekend style application. But the biggest problem we, we face is getting people to spend some time and work on their relationships, to work on their romantic relationships. And the second part, Part of that is we usually get the female to say, all right, we need to work on this. But there's a lot of reluctant males who still won't go along. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Not sure I can help with that. I don't think I'm qualified. I don't think, you, well, since I haven't figured it out, I'd be amazed if you had, but I thought I'd try. <laughs> okay. Fair days. How can people get hold of you? On LinkedIn. Mike Bosworth on LinkedIn. Easy peasy. Excellent. Mike Bosworth, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I enjoyed it. It's been a barrel of laughs. Thank you so much. All right. If you're the owner or the CEO of a tech company and your goal is to grow your business, achieve real sustainable and profitable hypergrowth with highly engaged and highly productive employees and clients who stick with you for decades, then let's schedule time for a brief conversation. My email is marcus at laughs-last.com or direct message me on LinkedIn. Now, if you found this conversation useful and insightful, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you feel the urge, then give it an honest review. One star, three stars, five stars, whatever. 
In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.